it's hard for us to really feel and understand the pain behind these pages in this opening chapter. Under the gloss of our familiarity with Daniel, there is a world of pain. There's nothing really, I think, in our life experiences to compare to the step-by-step dismantling of the kingdom of Judah that happened between 605 BC and 586, over a period of roughly 20 years, by the Babylonians. Progressively, her people and her treasures were carried off before finally the city of Jerusalem, after a two-year siege and all the horrors of starvation and disease that would go along with the siege, before the city is overrun and sacked, pretty much dismantled and just left to burn, and most of the population either slaughtered or slaves. It's not just the pain, you see, of the human suffering, of the, the, the pillage and the butchery and perhaps even cannibalism of the siege, or the forced relocation uh, hundreds of miles away of hundreds of people, or all the emotional mental hurt that goes with all those things. It's not just that. It's not simply either just the pain of seeing society break down. You know, for these people, we have to remember, this is their whole world being dismantled and destroyed. All that surrounds you, All that you know, value and treasure, dismantled and taken away. It's not just the human suffering and the societal breakdown that we could maybe pass through something similar. There's a unique religious aspect to all the pain of the exile. In two ways, we could say. First of all, from a spiritual perspective, there's the pain that God, their God, has done this. He promised it for their disobedience and now he's doing exactly what he promised and exactly what he warned repeatedly over hundreds of years. But more than that, compounding all that pain, there's the pain that, especially for the faithful among them, like Daniel and his three friends, that their God himself seems to have been defeated. God's own temple, God's own palace as it were, has been ransacked and destroyed and his treasures carted off as trophies to be put in the display cabinet of the temples of the false gods. So there's a religious side to the pain of the exile that I think it would be hard for us to to have anything to compare to and it's a double-edged sword. God has done it to his people and God himself seems to have been defeated. And it's hard for us to to get a sense of the despair and the pain. And that's why the Psalms are are so beautiful that speak to us of this, so helpful. Behind this familiar story is unspeakable pain. It starts with the greatest imaginable disaster. And the story of Daniel plays out with that pain all in the background Remember back to Psalm 74, we we, uh, read it last week. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why in anger burn against the sheep that uh, that, that are in your pasture? This is the greatest possible disaster for God's people, God's purpose, and God's plan. The world has done its worst. That's where we are at the start of Daniel. And that's the backdrop the story plays out against. The world has been at war against God from Genesis chapter 3. Satan against God, evil against good, darkness against light. And now it seems that darkness, evil and Satan have won. The world has done its worst and won. To all intents and purposes, the world has won. The world has done its worst. And some of us are there at the minute, aren't we? We're looking at our current situation and thinking the world has done its worst. We're cut off from the means of grace to one degree or another. We're cut off from each other. Society around us is in meltdown, whether because of the virus or lockdown 
or simply just the, the general moral meltdown that's happening in our nations. And we're looking at the current situation and we're thinking, the world has done its worst. Some this week have been staring death in the face, either the sudden death of a beloved neighbour or the quicker than expected deterioration. Perhaps some are looking at their own life situation and thinking, the world has done its worst here. Maybe that's where you are this morning. The world has done its worst. Well, let's look to see what this chapter says to us when the world has done its worst. First of all, let's think a bit more about this disaster. I want us to see in verses 1 to 7 the total ruin, a total ruination. This is a total ruination on two levels. Total disaster on two levels. First of all, communally for Daniel's people, and then secondly, for Daniel personally. First of all, for Daniel's people, the Jews, and we've already touched on this, God's place is destroyed. The, the walls and the homes of God's city are a pile of smoking rubble. God's people are deported. Picture the starved, skeletal people put in chains and marched hundreds of miles. God's king has been marched off and forced to swear loyalty to his enemies, to a pagan king. And God's palace, God's temple, has been looted. Verse 3. Sorry, verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. It's not just that God's palace has been looted. God has as it were, or as it would seem, God himself has been imprisoned in the palace of the false gods. God's very plan of salvation seems to have been reversed. Remember that what we talked about, Genesis 11 and 12, God calls a people out of this land and brings them all the way to the promised land. And now, once again, God scatters a people in judgment and sends his people back from where they came from. And it seems like God's plan of salvation is undone and reversed. Total ruin for God's people. And on top of that, we read on, we find out that their very identity is under threat. Nebuchadnezzar, we're told in verse 4, removes the young leaders of tomorrow from the very cream of society, the nobility the royal family. He enrolls them at the University of Babylon and he makes them read Babylon, speak Babylon, eat Babylon, think Babylon. What's he doing? He's rubbing out their identity, their cultural identity, and he's redrawing them as little mini Babylonians. And so when they are graduated and qualified, they can work in his empire and enforce his policies, that they can go to all the captive peoples and places and enforce Babylonian culture. As we were saying in our men's fellowship on Tuesday night, you don't need many influencers, you just need influencers. A small number to influence a whole lot. And that's what, Bab what Babylon is doing here. These opening verses set before us the total ruin of God's people, even it seems God's plan of salvation. All that they had, all that God has done for them, their future, all of it being undone. So it's total ruin for Daniel's people and it's total ruin for Daniel personally. It seems widely accepted by many writers that Daniel and his friends are around the age of 14 when they are taken away just when you work out the dates and things that were told in the book. So, as a teenager, he's taken from his home and his family, transported hundreds of miles, immersed in reading, speaking, and learning a new culture. His name has changed. Daniel's name means, my God is judge. The L bit in Daniel is a pointer to the name of God. 
and his name was taken away and he's renamed Belteshazzar. And the Bel bit in his name points to a Babylonian god, Bel. And the same with the other three. All their names have a bit that points to God and they're taken away and they're given names that point to Babylon's gods. Even his food comes from the king's table. And yes, that's very kind, but it's not a way of saying, you're mine now. Your daily bread comes from me. And look how good I'm being to you. All of it designed to dissolve who he is and then remodel him. Build him up differently. So as a 14-year-old boy, Daniel is renamed, removed from home and family by thousands, hundreds of miles, and brainwashed. And the point I want us to see now is that this total ruin for God's people, for Daniel's people, and for Daniel personally, this total ruination is the doing of God. Daniel, as he writes this, leaves us in no doubt. Listen to verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim of Judah into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And they brought them to the land of Shinar and placed them in the treasury of his God. In these two verses we are given, we're told how to view history. We're to view history in two ways, take a twofold approach to it. First of all, we see that Nebuchadnezzar, on a human level, Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem and carts off the people and the treasures. But then we see on another level that God gives his city, his people, his treasures into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. In this moment of total ruination, of unspeakable pain and devastation, when darkness seems to have won, at this moment when the world seems to have done its worst, God is not asleep. God is in control. God is giving his people over to this. He's not responsible ultimately for it and for the evil of it, but he's giving them over. So I want us to look this text, this book of Daniel that we know of, I want us to look it squarely in the eye and see the issue it sets before us. See your world of pain, whatever it is, and see that God is squarely in control of it all. And the question then that faces us when we see this is who is this Lord who gives his people into hands like this? Verse 2, it's the word for, for master or, or ruler. Who is this master who gives kings over to judgment? Who is this Lord whom emperors receive kings and kingdoms from? Who is this Lord that even seems to give over his own treasures? Seemingly gives himself up to shame. Because the answer to who holds the reins of our lives and what type of Lord he is determines everything. That's the question that this book sets before us. Total ruin. In verses 8 to 16 we see total resolve. What should be the response of the people of God in the face of this disaster, this pain, this trauma that God gives to his people? There's a word play in verse 8 that's lost a little bit in translation. In verse 7, we're told twice, almost as if it's the climax of the personal pain for Daniel and his friends, that the chief eunuch set names upon them. Twice we're told that names are set upon them. But then in verse 8, we're told that Daniel set his heart not to defile himself with the king's food. Babylon is setting new identities on Daniel and his friends, but Daniel is setting his heart on his identity under God and serving his God. 
He sets himself not to eat the king's food. What was wrong with the king's food? Well, we can't be sure. It might be that the food had been offered to idols first. It might be that it was unclean, non-kosher food, not allowed by God's law. It might be simply that it was symbolic of the high life of Babylon and, and entering into the Babylonian world, and he didn't want to do that. We can't be clear on the reason, but what we can be clear uh, on is that Daniel did not want to defile himself. And so to eat would have defiled himself in some way. And so in the face of the defilement of the world, Daniel and his friends resolved to remain pure. They resolved to honour God and they resolved to be dedicated to God, regardless of the pain and regardless of the world's attack. It's a costly, risky move. move. The, The chief eunuch won't let them do it because quite literally his head is on the line. He says, why should you look haggard and gaunt on a worse diet? My job is to... Uh, obey the king's commands first of all and then to produce the finest uh, civil servants that I can you would put my head on the line with this there's a risk for the four fellows themselves this could be seen as a rejection of of Babylon and all that they're trying to do to them this is direct disobedience to the king's command that they should eat his food it's a it's a slight to the king himself and to, to his table this is a risk But a lower official lets them test it for 10 days. And so for 10 days, they have nothing but vegetables and water. Fair play to them. Verse 15, we're told, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. It's a success. In fact, it's so successful that Babylonian education policy is redefined. Verse 16, so the steward took away their food, the whole group, and the wine they were to drink, and gave them vegetables. And you can imagine that they were very popular indeed. Daniel's resolve is to be pure and undefiled before his God. And isn't that remarkable? Given the pain that Daniel and his people have passed through, Isn't it remarkable, actually, when you think of it like that? Their God seems to have been defeated. Their God has has given these four men over to this personal suffering that they're enduring. And Daniel sticks his colors to the mast of this God. Why? Why does he resolve? Why does he nail his colors to this God? coming to it in a moment but there's a hint in this section verse 9 and God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs here hundreds of miles from home deep in Babylon deep in enemy territory deep in the land of judgment here is covenant love and compassion Here, here is God working to bless his people. This is the God that Daniel is nailing his colors to. He's that kind of God. He's the God who is worth sticking with, worth resolving to stick with, whatever the risks and whatever the pain. He's worth our total resolve. And in this world where we look out and we see the world doing its worst, I want to put it to all of us, today that this God who is in control he's worth sticking with he is worth our total resolve to serve him and live for him he's worth it and we see this clearest of all at the end of the chapter as as it builds to a climax and this whole chapter functions as an introduction to the book we have a total reversal in verses 17 to 21. In verses 3 and 4, we're told that the king of Babylon was looking for skillful, wise, understanding, perceptive, learned young men to be trained for three years. In verse 17, we're told that God gave them 
gave these four men learning, skill, wisdom, verse 20, understanding, the very things the king is looking for. He gives to these young men. These guys pass their oral exam with the king of Babylon, flying colors. In fact, they're top of the class. And so they're appointed to his service. And they don't just start well, they continue well. They excel in his service. Verse 20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And that's what we see play out over the next six chapters. They're far better than all the others. They're far better than all the world's wisdom. God's wisdom, better than the world's wisdom. And young people in particular file that away because the older you get, the more you will see that. That God's wisdom is far superior to the world's wisdom. Just as they saw in Babylon. And Daniel remains in service, verse 21, until the first year of Cyrus, the Persian king. That's 66 years. Daniel is in the service of a series of Babylonian kings. But the point in verse 21, I think, is not so much the length of service. It's the who he serves. This little Jewish boy from the smoking refuse pile that Jerusalem had become. Outlasts the Babylonian Empire. And is still there as the Babylonian Empire is swept away by Cyrus the Persian. He outlasts the Babylonian Empire that seems to defeat his people and his God. And God has him there and God gives him the skills that he needs. Here's the point. From the rubble of the exile... And from its pain, God is raising up men, his men, to power and to influence in enemy territory. And Daniel was there until the first year of Cyrus. Verse 18, at the end of the time that when they were brought in, the king spoke with them. None was found like Mishael, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Everything is reversed. At Jerusalem, the world seemed to win and God's plan seemed to be thwarted. But this chapter says to us, but look what God has done. Look what God has done. This is the God who holds the reins of our lives in his hands. This is the type of God he is. He's the God who reverses situations totally. Even his own seeming shame, even his own seeming shame, it seems like God himself is captured and carted off to Babylon. And we see in this book all the way through that that's not the case. It seems like shame, but he rules and he wins. It's a strange thought, isn't it, that God gave Jehoiakim into Babylon's hands, like we read at verse 1 or verse 2. It's a strange thought that God gave his own temple to defeat and plundering. In a sense, God himself endures the exile He identified with it and he endured the shame all so that he could reveal his glory. All so that he could be seen to rule in nations. It's a strange thought, isn't it? But that's the thought. Here's a God who endured shame to identify with his people, to reveal his glory to the nations, to reveal his rule to the nations, to bless his people and to bless the nations. That's the God of Daniel. That's the God of the Bible. And it's the same God that goes to the cross in Jesus Christ and endures the shame 
to identify with his people in their sin. Endures the shame of the world doing its worst. All to reveal his glory. All to rule over the nations. All to bless his people. You see, what we see in Daniel, what we see ultimately, clearest of all, at the cross, through the cross, is that when the world does its worst, God is doing his best. And not in the sense of he's trying hard, he's trying his best, but no, God is actually doing the things that are best. Not good, not better, but the best. When the world is doing its worst, God is doing his best, the best. At the cross, it all seemed undone. It seemed like shame. It seemed like evil had won. And then he came bursting out of the tomb so that he could reign forevermore and his people enjoy him forevermore. Total reversal. This is the God that holds the reins of our lives in his hands, who controls all that happens to us. This is a God who's worthy of your total resolve to serve him no matter what, like Daniel. And some of us need this hope set before us. We're looking at the current situation thinking the world has done its worst to us. We're cut off from the means of grace to a degree. We're cut off from each other, physically, relationally. Society's melting down, people are melting down, whether because of the virus and restrictions or just the moral meltdown of our day and the age. And we're looking at the current situation and we're thinking the world has done its worst. I'm not saying today you're wrong in that assessment. I'm saying, so what? Because when the world does its worst, God does his best. And I say to you today, so what? Look what God can do. Amen.